and the HTC Vive setup. So you can try it. If you have not done that, you have to go. It's awesome. You'll have such a great time. Uh, and you look like you have dreadlocks. You do, because there's like all these cables coming out of the back of your head. It's kind of cool. You look like something out of that Star Trek uh, insurrection. Nobody's laughing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, Sasha told me to talk about obscure tech. So I decided, let's talk about practical software development with Newton script. So if you've got one of these newfangled devices, Apple's got some amazing stuff that they just released like 20 years ago. Um, they got the Newton message pad, right? Have you seen this? It's like the iPad, but you know, mono. And then this is the email. So if you ever, anyone ever seen email? So this is Apple's, uh, you know, classroom solution. It could last for days on battery. It was rechargeable, unlike this, which lasted for two weeks on four double A's. And you could drop it, which I've done that a few times, and nothing happens. And it looks like something out of Batman. I'm not dropping it today. You don't drop these so much, and you can't buy them anymore. So, anyway. And then this, for anyone, does anyone know what this is? You told me. This is the, the super rare limited edition uh, clear Newton message pad. There were, there were only a few hundred made, and it's worth a few thousand dollars now. But pretty cool, and you can actually see like the insides of the Newton, and it still works. Works like a champ. So anyway, um, I used to be a Newton developer back in the day. Uh, I wrote a few applications. Uh, they were mostly just fun, crazy apps. Uh, like I wrote a buzzword generator. That was fun, um, and it got a lot of downloads, which I guess for Newton is like 50. So I, I don't remember what it was, but a lot of people used it, you know, on their Newtons because you only had um, a little bit of storage space. So you know, when you're going to start writing code for the Newton, you should probably know your resources. Very important. Um, you've got 20 megahertz to work with, which you know is pretty good when you only have a black and white screen and practically nothing running. There's there's nothing running at the same time. You know. um, so anyway, you can get ARM 610 at 20 megahertz, or if you wait a few years you could run at 164 megahertz. Which, by the way, that thing was a badass machine, the Newton uh, 2100. It was so much fun. Um, I used it, and uh, it was less than 30 days later, I was at the Windows 95 launch event, and some schmuck sitting next to me was in a rush to get out, bumped into me, and my brand new $1,200 Newton message pad fell about 20 feet to the ground and cracked. And I couldn't get it replaced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he ran off. He ran off. He was, yeah, didn't care. He was in some crazy rush and pushed past me. And I was, Microsoft. Right, 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 right. No, he was another reporter. Yeah. No, a lot of you reporters. You couldn't find a replacement at the Japanese Costco. <laughs> I couldn't afford to go to the Japanese Costco back then. I was, just, I was what, like 22? You know, I was like, oh, cool. I just spent 1,200 dollars. I can't afford it. Um, so if you're lucky. Um, You've got one of the newer uh, Newton message pads, so you get uh, one or four megs of RAM. Now, uh, crazy thing is, is on the previous ones, they were only 640K to two and a half megs, but the problem is they were all battery backed. So if you wanted to have um, your data stay around, you better make sure that A, you swap out those four double A's every few weeks, or B, uh, you make sure that that clock, that little watch battery that's in there doesn't die. Otherwise, you lose all your data. There is no backing up. Unless you have a really expensive PC card, where back then I think a megabyte card was a few hundred dollars. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's how you expand it, a PC card. Now, if you're going to use the file system, you get to store files in up to 64K at a time, and that's all stored in the soup. So that's what the file system is called. The internal storage is called a soup. And basically, every single object in the entire operating system, in all the applications, etc., all gets registered in one big data lake that is called the soup. Now, this is the first operating system to ever do this. Everything is just an accessible object in the OS, in your applications. And there is no file paths. You just have the name of the soup, the name of the package, and then whatever object is in it, and you can access it. Security be damned. This is also the last 
for him. But there's a, uh, no, BOS is still out, and I think it actually supported things like this, the real-time um, object-based operating system. So you save something, and instantly everything that's subscribed to that or uses it knows about it. It's very cool. Um, there was no Wi-Fi, of course. Oh, if you wanted to store uh, big files, you basically had to string a whole bunch of uh, the 64K blocks together, and those were called arrays or LBOs, like large binary objects. And then, uh, if you wanted, um, you can connect it to your Macintosh, because that's all there was at the time. And then they finally came out with a serial connectivity kit that was expensive, and I bought it. And there was uh, Apple Talk support. Anybody remember Apple Talk? Yeah. So I did use Apple Talk. That was how I was able to get my, uh, my Newton to actually talk to a printer on my local net. So if anybody remembers phone net, where you connected all the computers together using your, what is it, RJ11? I think that's it. And then um, you could print the things, like your image writer printer. Yeah? So, huh, anyone here old enough to remember that? Yeah. So anyway, um, so there were a few different languages that you could write in. Uh, primarily, you would write all of your code in Newton script, which is what I did initially. Uh, and then they came out with this really cool solution uh, from George Hanna, nice guy. Um, called NS Basic, which you can still write with today. You can still write with NS Basic, and if you write your apps in NS Basic, it will run on iOS, Android, Newton, funny, uh, Windows, Mac OS, Windows Phone 8 and 8, 1 and 10, I think. It's pretty cool. Uh, and I think they even have like a web plugin. But anyway, he's been maintaining this for, what, 20 years now? <coughs> so if you've never heard of NS Basic, it's pretty cool. And he has some sort of following, but I don't know what it is these days. Um, and then, of course, the display, uh, 320 by 240 in black and white. So prior to the eMake, you really didn't have to push that many pixels. Pretty easy. And then you could do uh, 480 by 320 with a whopping 16 shades of gray. There's never a color eMate or um, Newton. But we won. We really won it. But back then, color displays were really expensive, and the four AA batteries will not power that. So before you write your code using Newton script or write, writing for your, uh, your Newton, which those are all called packages, those apps, those final apps, uh, make sure that you understand what you're about to write to because you don't have a lot of resources to run with. So Newton script, if you're going to go learn it, it's an uh, uh, amalgamation of a few different languages. There's Pascal, there's Smalltalk, and there's Scheme, all put together. So Pascal wasn't object-oriented, at least uh, when I used it, it wasn't. Um, so they just put scheme in there, yay. And then they had small talk. So construct-wise, it looks very similar to Pascal. I don't know much of anything about scheme, but what I've read is that's how its variables work. Uh, basically, it's typeless, but you can have types. But it was the first typeless language um, on a widespread user base. Because they sold a lot of Newtons even though Steve Jobs crushed it. So uh, that, that was the first programming language to have to be widespread and have um, a typeless, you know, dynamically typed language. And then, of course, Smalltalk, which if you've ever written in script of C, life sucks. So anyway, uh, everything was jitted. So everything was stored as bytecode. They were working on a native compiler for it, but it never came out. Bummer. Um, I couldn't find any evidence of it ever existing. I thought things, I thought there might be a C compiler for it, but I couldn't find it. So everything seemed to actually be run in Newton script, not natively compiled, and jitted before runtime. Yay. Um, it was the first uh, widespread object oriented uh, programming language on a widespread device. So that's what they said anyway. And the way this works is every application is um, a package that has a frame, and then frames have views. And basically, you just have that parent frame, and you stack views on top of each other, and that's how they communicate. Um, the frame is effectively like self. So when you start your application, you can say self, and then add child objects to self, and then you can add and remove them as you see fit. It's actually very simple. I had to 
think back to my coding days of that, and it's really neat, actually, how it worked. It was very easy to write, um, especially since at the time I basically just knew Pascal and C, so it was easy to figure out. Um, so it actually supported um, prototypes for theming, so you could create a proto of a view and then take anything, take any new view and say, okay, you're going to inherit this proto, and now it follows that theme, and then all you had to do was update the, um, it won't take that much longer, uh, you just update the proto, and boom, all of your other views would be updated. That's very cool. Um, let's see. And then, of course, if, you know, when it got to the nitty gritty of it, everything ended with NWT or PKJ, or PKG, pardon me. And like I said, apps were already called packages. So, I won't go, do I have time to go through all this? No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rose. That's so fast. <laughs> oh, I want to show you one last thing. One last thing. Um, object oriented programming. And working with the file system. So, this is how it worked. You just passed in a soup. And here's how you could basically just loop into it. Hey, whatever this soup is, which is the file storage system that you want me to work with, you know, which is like the internal storage. Go through it and find whatever data, permissions be damned, and, and then you're done. It's actually a really easy to read language. Uh, there was no internet access, but they had an abstraction layer. So all you did was create an endpoint and all the applications would work with it. So you'd say, you hit this endpoint, it didn't care how it was implemented, it would just work. So they actually did end up coming up with a TCP IP stack, I found out. And there was a web browser for it called Pocket Web. And if you're interested on in learning more, there's 10 minutes, wow, I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> there's there's a, a Newton software architecture guide, if you want to know how the whole thing was built. Uh, it's really neat. Um, how to work with your Newton, write games, and use the uh, Nuitut uh, dev environment, or you just go get MS Basic. And well, if you want to know about Claris the dog cow, there's a link to that. Uh, if you're really curious, I did bring with me from my old, old, old days the programming for the Newton book. So if anyone wants to check out what Newton programming was like many, many years ago, um, I do have this. I don't have my borders. <laughs> <laughs> There are emulators for the Sharp Zorus. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, one out of three. And I'm done. <laughs>